All right. Uh, real quick, we, I would like to invite Holt to come forward and bring his mom and dad with him. Uh, this is Nick and Krista Miller and little baby Holt. Um, he's doing probably what a lot of you want to do right now. And... Uh, <laughs> So we're all envious of Holt. Uh, this is Holt and his older sister, Knox. We, uh, we met Knox, what, two years ago now? Man, no, live. That's crazy. Uh, well, they brought uh, Holt to dedicate back to the Lord. And so we're going to do that this morning. And uh, a little bit about Holt. Uh, Holt was born on Mother's Day. So of all things, a pretty special day uh, for that. Um, how did they choose the name? Holt came from a long list of names, and it's just the one they settled on. There was no family significance. Um, Holt loves his family, especially his sister, Knox, and loves to eat, and believe it or not, likes to make noise. Um, <laughs> so this is good. Um, Holt does not like to be sat down and walked away from. So who does? I think that's really... Holt's personality is happy, smiling, very easygoing, and they are dedicating him so he grows up knowing and loving and talking to God, knowing the sacrifice Jesus made for him. Their hopes and dreams are for Holt to follow his hopes and dreams and to serve God. So what a beautiful opportunity we get this morning. So we have a little, uh, little thing that um, I think, remember last time we did it, don't jump the gun, I'm going to cue you up on what to say, but I'm going to ask you some questions in terms of our faith and our growing of faith and your responsibility as parents. We understand that dedication back to the Lord is not a sa salvation for your child. It's, a, it's you and your commitment to grow, uh, to lead your children into a faith that's so one day that they can make that profession of faith themselves. The dedication of children follows a Jewish custom of going to the temple and presenting infants to the Lord. Joseph and Mary followed this practice when they took infant Jesus to the temple for presentation. This ritual recognizes that a child is a special gift from God with a purpose to be fulfilled for his glory. It recognizes the responsibility of parents and of the church in raising the child to know and love God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. You must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're giving, getting up. Nick and Christy, you have brought this child whom God has given you to be dedicated back to him, thereby testifying to your own commitment of faith in Christ and the assurance you hold that the grace of God is even now at work in his life. From the day he was born, it has been your duty as parents to teach and nurture the meaning of what we are doing here today, that this is something you did as an act of obedience to God, and that someday he will decide for himself whether to be obedient to God. In order to testify to your faith and to your desire to nurture your children within the Christian faith, please respond to a couple questions. Is it your promise with the help of God and the support of those around you to bring up your children in the instruction and discipline of the Lord, to pray with them and for them, to make every effort to so order your own life that you will not cause this little one to stumble. If this is your desire and promise, please answer, by God's help, we will. Is it your promise that you will make every effort to faithfully worship, give, and serve in Christ's church in order that your faith may grow and your child may hear and know of the surpassing joy of the good news of Jesus Christ? If this is your desire and promise, please answer, by God's help, we will. Is it your promise to encourage your children, as soon as they are able, to comprehend its significance, to acknowledge personally their own faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? If this is your desire and promise, please answer by God's help. We will. Math, Mark 10, 13 to 16 says this. One day some parents brought their children to Jesus so that he could touch and bless them, but the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. He said to them, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Then he took the ch ch children in his arms and placed his hands on their heads and blessed them. Sometimes I like to hold the baby. I think we're going to avoid that this morning. Just <laughs> he's resting very, very peacefully. Um, I'm 
going to try not to wake him, okay? Holt, on behalf of your mom and your dad, I dedicate you to the Lord in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Would you join me in praying over Holt and mom and dad? Merciful God, I thank you so much for Holt, his joyous that he brings to life. I thank you for his sister Knox. I thank you for his mom and dad. But God, as Holt grows up, grows strong in body and mind and heart, I pray that every day you would remind him that you are here, that you give mom and dad the resilience to love and to lead, to serve you faithfully, that Knox would one day come to know you and know your ever-present mercy and grace and love. Amen. We give uh, the family, the dedicated family, so they may have a Bible. We give them this little one that they can read. Um, It's full of pictures for those of us that like pictures um, and a little uh, certificate of dedication that they can choose to do what they wish for. So would you join me in welcoming Holt to family? Well, it, oops. Anyway, my name is Kirby. Sorry, I'm getting my stuff together here. Uh, I'm the lead pastor here at Living Hope. Great to be with you. Um, We got one more Sunday before it gets cold, but we're here, right? But that reminds me that next Tuesday, not in two days, but next Tuesday is Halloween night, and we need candy. We are not, we do not have enough candy. Um, and I say that because every, so every Halloween, if you don't know, if you're not from here, uh, downtown, they put on a walk for kids. They go to different businesses and they hand out candy. It's a great, it's essentially like a Halloween parade. It's going to be awesome. And we set up a table by Christensen Water. And if you want to serve in that, just show up, uh, hand out some candy. We need some people to make hot chocolate, bring it down, things like that. Um, but we need to hand out candy. There's several hundred kids and we need a lot of candy. So next time you're at the store, uh, if you pass down the candy aisle, don't say no to your kid. Just grab a bag, throw it in the cart, and bring it to the church. That'd be great so we can do that uh, and give it to our our child. That'd be awesome. Um, In December, um, right now, actually, there's six kids, five kids. Five kids? I don't know. There are some kids along with my wife, out in Rapid City currently, and they're at the fall youth retreat in Rapid City. And so they're coming home today. Uh, So thank you for your prayers and thoughts on that. But in December, over Christmas break, there's a few of them going to Cincinnati, Ohio, for the National Youth Gathering called Follow. And that's in December. And so we're going to start raising funds for that. And in November 19th, we are going to have a pancake feed right here at the church. A pancake feed shortly after church, so like a little brunch. Just put it in your calendar now. S- decide to stick around for brunch. Make a, a large donation to the kids. Everything that we raise that day is going to help send these kids to follow. Uh, so we're going to load them on a bus with other churches, send them to Cincinnati in December for some reason, and send them back. Okay? Yes, we're coming back with them. So uh, make sure you join up and put it on your calendar now for that. A um, couple of other things. If you brought gift uh, and tithing and your offering and your faithfulness there, you, there are black boxes right as you walk out and up the stairs. It says Give Hope right there, right on the front. You can't miss it. Uh, or you can do it uh, online, that QR code. Uh, we have a lot of guests and family. Do not feel obligated. Uh, I'm just happy you're here. Um, but other than that, QR codes in front of you. There's paper in front of you. If you want to take notes, if you want to know what's going on in the church, you want to know about some events, it's all right there. Um, and, I, and I tell people all the time, like, I, I need to be able to get a hold of you if something goes on or if you say, um, why didn't you reach out and I don't have your contact, it's kind of hard to reach out. Uh, so m- that's the way that I can do that. It'll also get you in a newsletter, okay? All of that stuff. All right. One last thing. It's somebody's birthday. <laughs> it is Jenna's, what, 20, 21 and holding? 29 and holding? 21 and holding. <laughs> Jenna's been such a joy and a gift to the church for the last few months, not even that long, but uh, she's back home from, the, from a different part of this country and, and celebrating that, but we're going to embarrass her and make her bright red, which is going to be wonderful, and we're going to, uh, so we're going to sing happy birthday to Jenna. Ready? 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jenna. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Jenna, we love you. Enjoy your 21st birthday. <laughs> everybody, everybody dote on her like crazy afterwards and say hi. Um, with that, let's jump into our teaching. Hey, how's that? Um, so we're starting a, a little series where we're going to be looking at uh, a, a word uh, within the church. Now, within the church, if you've been around the church for a day or a year, a month, um, you understand that we've got some weird words. Like we've got some words, we've got some phrases that are very much churchy, right? Very church words that are really only used in this context. We don't go to the bank we probably don't go to our families. We don't go certain places and we use these words in random conversations. If you don't know what I mean, let me give you some examples. We are doing life together, sanctification, transubstantiation, incarnation, quiet time. Of course, we probably do that when we have a toddler. Um, hedge of protection, fellowship, life group, washed by the blood, Eucharist, dying to self, evangelism, laying on of hands, has a different meaning in church, born again, a holy kiss, propitiation, tribulation, body of Christ, atonement, substitutionary. These are not everyday words, and I'm sure some of you are thinking, like, I don't know what half of that means but you've heard them probably, and you, maybe you even came up with some of your own, right? I mean, the words we use are specific church words. They're words that we use only in this context, and they mean something, but we don't know it. And so one of the words that we are going to talk about for the next few weeks is one of these words, and it's holiness. Now, when, we, when I say holiness, we say, oh, I know what that means, and I, I think we have a concept, I think we have an awareness about the idea of holiness, but we don't fully grasp the, the overwhelming idea of what holiness actually means. But if I say God is holy, I think most of us would grasp that. Most of us would understand the concept that God is holy. Now, Living Hope is a Wesleyan church. And the first question I always get, what in the world is a Wesleyan? Valid question. Well, Wesleyan is a holiness church. Convenient, right? We are a holiness church. We have a holiness tradition. And we are a holiness tradition within the Protestant church. That's a whole lot of church words in one sentence, isn't it? But that's who we are. And if we are a holiness church, we should probably understand what holiness means a little bit, right? And so we're going to talk about this idea of holiness. Now, let, let, let's start this. What if I were to ask you three general categories? I, 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 I'm going to do some class participation. So uh, before you follow Holt's uh, cue, stay with me for a couple minutes. Class participation. I'm going to give you one category. I need you to give me two others. Anything, all right? Here's a category. Sports cars. Okay, get the concept? Category. Give me one more category. Animals, another category. Food, perfect. Food, animals, sports cars. All right, now, if we were to go around the room and I'd say, what is the best animal ever? What would you say? Everybody at once, go. You're wrong. I mean, th so the truth, is, now, what is, what is the greatest food ever? All at once. Wrong. Right? So we have this idea, we say, look, this is the, this is the category, and now we say, we say, this is the greatest, this is the greatest, this is the greatest, but then I ask you, and you have a totally different answer. That doesn't make sense to me. That's not the greatest. This is the greatest. But then we start erasing, we start adding, we start moving around, right? We start re-identifying. Now, at the end of the day, we're just going to quit because it's impossible to come up with the greatest of anything. Why? Because it's completely subjective. It's completely based on our own opinion. There is absolutely no way to say this is the greatest of all time. Now, if I give you a different category, here's the category. 
The category is a comic book character with a last name Wayne who dresses in black, doesn't have superpowers, but has a lot of money and many tools. This character drives around Gotham City and has an assistant named Alfred. Who is this person? Batman. According to this category, there is only one possible answer. They are the best in this category, right? There is no number two. There cannot be a number two, right? This is the category, and there's only one legitimate answer, and it's Batman. This idea, this simple little game, helps us understand the concept of holiness a little bit. Because we're going to look at this word, because I think we believe we understand it. We put it in a category, but we don't truly understand its, its depth or how to define it. I like how Pastor Rich Velotis uh, defines holiness. He says this, In our minds, holiness is usually about what we abstain from. But Jesus saw holiness as what you give yourself to, namely mercy, love, and hospitality. In the end, the holiest people are the ones who love well. More often than not, if you're anything like me, I grew up with holiness being what you abstain from, kind of like what he's talking about. All the things that we say no to. And if I say to no to enough bad things, that means I'm holier than you. That means I'm, I am in good graces with God. If I say no to this thing, this idea, this whatever, that means I'm a pretty holy person and I'm pretty close to God, right? And so we've defined holiness as what we are against and that makes us holy. But holiness starts, it finds itself, and it ends with God, not us. Not about the things that I do or can't do, but it starts, finds itself, and ends with God. And our little example of Batman and these categories, I think, helps us understand that there is no number two with God. That there is only one within this category in, the, in terms of the holiness. He is all alone. And now to be holy, we, we may have heard this phrase. This is another church phrase. To be set apart. Right? We've used that phrase in church a lot. To be set apart. Now, that's how we define God. That's how we define holy. That's a biblical idea. And to be set apart means to be uh, separate. It means to be different. It, it, It means to be outside of that, right? Now, if we understand that is God, that's holiness, what does that mean for us? To understand holiness, I think I want to go all the way back to the New Old Testament. And we're going to go into uh, the book of Leviticus. Leviticus now is a very hard book for us to understand. It's a very weird book. Um, It's it's filled with rituals. It's filled with customs. It's filled with uh, rules. All of this stuff that no longer applies to us and no longer applies to 21st century America. So it's very hard to interpret, very hard to understand all of the depth and complexity about what's going on. But within all of that, I think we can get a really good picture about the holiness of God. I don't think we need to understand all the customs. We don't need to understand all the stuff to understand that the holiness of God can be found here. All right, so let's take a look. Leviticus chapter 1145. It'll all be on the screen for you. 1145. I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. So God identifies himself as holy. God identifies himself as set apart. Now, for our sake, we're going to understand that as different. We're going to understand that as other, okay? So if God is set apart, God is other. It's it's, it's different. It's set apart, okay? Now, it's kind of a weird. I've never really expressed the holiness of God as other, right, or different. But help me me go, go with me on this one. Now, if we go over in Exodus 3, we see a story about this guy named Moses, um, Moses was in a place um, in his life where, like, if he was going for a job interview, the, the, the person sitting across from the table would ask Moses to explain the gap in his resume, right? That, like, this is where he's at. Because he had just left Pharaoh, he had just left Egypt, fled, fled Egypt, and now he's living in the country with his father-in-law. He finds, he starts a family, gets a wife, gets some kids, and is working for his father-in-law, tending to the, the livestock, 
And he's just going about his business, uh, doing nothing. But that's where he's going. He's not the leader of the Egyptians yet, or um, the Israelites yet. He is not leading them out of Egypt yet. So he's in this in-between place. He kind of found his role. He says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to tend the sheep, work with my father-in-law Jethro, settle down, have a wife, have a kid, and just go on with life. But something usually happens and God interferes with our plans. You ever experienced that one? Um, and that's about, what, about was what to happen to Moses. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 6 says this. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that, through the bu- that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see the strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this moment, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. All right, let's start with this idea of the burning bush. Now, this is, this, this is kind of along the same lines of like David and Goliath. Like even if you've never been to church, you've probably heard the idea or the story of the burning bush at some point, right? It's in every kid's Bible. It's, it's in every Sunday school class. We know the story so much so that we've lost its significance. We've lost its power in our lives, right? It's old hat. But this idea of a burning bush, a bush that is on fire but is not being consumed, is other. It's different. It's set apart. There is something going on there that is outside the forces of nature. This bush, which should be consumable if it is on fire, doesn't burn up. It is, it is something that is the, out of the ordinary, the order of things. And when we think of miracles, this is what we think of, right? It's, it's the things that are, there, there's a natural order of life that we go through. There are things that happen in a natural way. And then there are things that are unnatural, the holy movements of God. And we look for those. We want those. Those are the things we pray for, we petition for. Those are the things. But here's the deal. Those are not common Those are not ordinary. That's not the way it always works. That is uncommon. That is different. That is not the common everyday life that we have. And it's not the way that God truly interacts with us on an everyday basis. So when we think about the way we pray, the way we look at life, the way we go through all of this stuff, how we view the miracles of God should be held in in tension of that this is not ordinary. It's extraordinary. It's supernatural. It goes against the order of life, right? It's not an everyday occurrence. So when the bush is on fire but it does not burn, we see that God now has entered the picture. It's amazing to see how God enters this picture. So after leaving Pharaoh, he goes to work with his father-in-law, and he just settles down, goes into life, and is just going on with his routine of his sheep. And, but God says, I have something else for you. And he starts to instruct Moses. He says, and, and he starts this fire. He creates something that draws Moses in. And it's the holiness because God has shown up. He's taken the ordinary world and changed what's going on. And Moses is drawn to that. And now as he gets closer and closer, he gets closer to the holiness of God. And you know what happens? Everything around the holiness of God becomes holy. So the bush is where God is, God is, is residing in this story. And what else became holy in this story? The ground. It's just dirt. Just weeds, all that stuff we try to yank from our yard. Just rocks and sand. Might be feces of the cat animals he's just bringing up. I don't know. But you catch this? The closer you get to a holy God, the things around it become holy. Every day, common stuff, common people become holy the closer we get to a holy God. 
So with our working definition of holy, as set apart, as different, as uncommon, as other, we see God as so much more than just a knowledge. Like I've got a knowledge of God. I have an awareness of God. I've had an experience with God. The holiness of God is so much more of that. Because when God shows up, or when God is interacting in this, in this way, everything around it becomes holy. And so when God says that you can be holy, what does that mean for the people and the things and everything around you? If everything around God becomes holy, what does that mean for us? He had no choice. Look at what Moses in verse 6. He says, at this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. This was the only response Moses could come up with in terms of a holy God. There is a clear distinction between a holy God and us. There is a distinction between holy and common. There is a distinction that sets us, that sets God apart in all this. So when we jump ahead now, we're going to jump ahead in the story of Moses. We're going to jump ahead to a point where Moses is not the only one that gets to witness this. See, at the burning bush, he's up there all by himself, only him and the sheep. And he witnesses this amazing thing. And I can imagine people like, sure, Moses, bush, fire, okay, right? But he's the only one to witness it. It now shifts. We're jumping ahead in the story. And the entire nation gets to witness the power of a holy God. And he gets to share that. And there's an, a, a celebration. There is a praise. They have just been, been led out of Egypt. They've been l- led through the Red Sea, right? The parting of the waters. That's just another story we mo- most of us know. And they have this, this angry mob, this army chasing them. And what happens? The water collapses on them. They're all gone, no more. But the people are free, right? And what do they do? They have a party. They have a, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a thing. They're on the other side of the water and they're having a party. And this is how, what they sing. This is what they say back to God in Exodus 15. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? That's a weird question. Who is like you? Majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders. Now, I can see this, right? So some of you are going to go home this afternoon and, and watch the Vikings lose, and that's okay. Oh, no, that's tomorrow night. They're going to lose tomorrow night. Um, but you're, you're Anyways, so you're going to go home and maybe watch a game or maybe you watch some baseball this week, right? And when something good happens, yay, right? And everybody cheers, everybody gets up and a- anything bad happens, it's like, ah, right? But I can, can I, can't you picture this? Like the people are on the other side of the water, this amazing thing happens and they're like, who among you, right? I can see them, there's like chanting against the opposite team, right? Our team is the best, God is the greatest. Our God is the best. That team, that, that, their leaders are terrible. Right? Can't you just picture it? This is exactly what happens at a sporting event. And they're singing, and they're, and they're, and they're praising, and they're dancing, and they're, they're celebrating their victor. They're celebrating their leader, their holy God. It then explains why. Why do we do this? Why are we celebrating All of those encounters with God from the burning bush up until now, Moses now fully understands the holiness of God, that it's other, that it's distinct, that there's nobody like him, that there is nothing like it, that there there is nothing that can compare. There's no category that can compare or compete with God. He alone is the one with power. He is the alone the one that is alone with majesty. He is it. And there's an example of that where they celebrate this. That's what they're celebrating. There's another story I want to point to in the Old Testament. It's found in the book of Jeremiah. And and for a little context, uh, we need to understand that Jeremiah was a great prophet of Israel. He was a fantastic prophet. And this story and all the experiences of uh, Jeremiah happened... uh, years and years and years after Moses, okay? So a long time. The people of it had a lot of experience with God. They experienced with God the, the, the highs and the lows. They were almost completely wiped out as a nation. Um, they had victories and all this stuff. So years and years after, they've had all of this experience with God, and here's where uh, Jeremiah is found. In Jeremiah chapter 9, this is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength or the rich boast of their riches, but let the one who boasts boast about this. This is why they're singing. 
that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declared the Lord. They're told about who God is and what God is about. By us knowing God, about the holiness of God, that gives us cause to have this response. This is the reason for their celebration. This is the reason that we should have a celebration, that it's what we are identified with. We are identified with God. That is what we're celebrating. We're not celebrating the fact that all of this uncommon things happened, all these powerful movements. We're not, we're not celebrating the fact that we've got it all figured out. All the, look at us, look how good we are, look at the things that we haven't done. We are boasting literally about the fact that we know the holy God, that we know the God that is powerful enough to do this. That is what God is telling us we need to boast about. Just for the sheer knowledge of knowing him. You ever had that experience? Maybe, maybe with some other, you know, somebody name dropping on you? Like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm friends with uh, Mike. You know Mike, right? Oh yeah, yeah, everybody knows Mike, right? And they start talking up Mike or whoever it is. That's it. They're boasting about who they know and the power that it comes with knowing them. This is what God is saying we boast about. Yes, my God, my Savior, my God is so powerful. Oh, the way he is uncommon and he's set apart, this is how we can know God. And God invites us closer. He tells us, draw close. He brings us in with the holiness of God. And the closer we get to the holiness of God, everything around it becomes holy. So when we say, God, I want to follow you, I want to serve you, I give you my life, there is a presence of God that starts to fill the space. And when I think about that, when I think about the holiness of God, I start to, to kind of reflect on my relationships, like my wife, my kids, my friends, all of this stuff, my family, my siblings that I never talk to, just kidding. Um, like, I think of all this stuff, right? Now, if I'm going to develop those relationships, I need to be intentional, right? I can't just show up once a week and say hi to my wife and walk out the door. There's not going to be good consequences, right? It just, the, the relationship will deteriorate. So if I want to be intentional, I want to grow in that relationship, I want that thing to develop, that's, God is putting that bush in front of you and, and drawing you in. Like, if, if I want my relationship to grow, I need to pursue them. God says, I want you to come to me. He's pursuing you. He's trying to draw you in. Like, look, come to me. Come to me. Come, come, come. And as you get closer, you will experience the presence of God, of a holy God. And that is what we're going to boast about. Because the closer we get to someone, the more we can trust them, right? We can trust somebody when we know them intricately. When they know us, there is a trust that is established. There is a trust that's built. The closer we get to a holy God, the more we can trust that he is working for our good. And contrasting that with a holy God, it's pretty uncommon, God, the, the uncommon holiness of God versus the common us every single day just living life. And how do we do that? And God says, come close to me. Come close. I want you to come close. Take off your sandals. Stand in the dirt. Stand where you are at work, on the farm, in life, in your house, in your school. Stand there and come to me and it's holy because I'm here. I am here, and so are you, and you are following me. Come, come, come. He is pursuing you. How are you going to respond to an uncommon calling where the holy God, the one where there's no definition, is literally wanting to be with you? How are you going to respond to that? Are you going to run away that a, burn, that a bush is burning and you have no idea what's going on, that that's freaky, I'm going to go take care of my sheep? Or are you going to draw closer to figure it out? God is calling you to a holy, holy place that is the most defining characteristic of God that we have, is his holiness. And what's crazy is that along the way, he has called you to be holy. And in fact, he says that, that when you surrender your life, when you give your life to God, he has made you holy. It's crazy to think about. If I'm holy, 
And if I understand that I'm set apart, that I'm different, that I'm unique, what's happening to the dirt under my feet? When people get close to me, what are they experiencing? Are they experiencing just vitriol? Are they experiencing anger, bitterness, slander? I'm not telling you you can't be angry. But what do they experience? Do they experience the holy presence? I'm not, be, I'm be very careful. I'm not saying that we are God. But when they step into our presence, do they experience a holy God that is set apart? Or are they just experiencing the common every day? Because the uncommon separate, if we say you're set apart, you're separate from the world. You are set apart from the world. It doesn't mean you, you just follow all the rules and you, it's all the things that you say you don't do because then if I don't do this, then I'm different from the world and look how holy I am. The holiness of God says if you're set apart from the world, you're going to be more gracious and loving and merciful and understanding. That is different than the world. That is different. To experience someone that gives you understanding, to give you patience. That's different. In a culture that is, pr- is bound and determined to prove that we are right, what does it look like when people step near you? Are they experiencing something different, something uncommon from this world? And it's not just because you say one less cuss word. What are they experiencing in your presence And that's how we can understand a holy God. So for the next few weeks, we're going to lean into more a little bit of this holiness because this is our working definition, that God is separate. God is uncommon. He's in a category all by himself. And if that's the case, that gives us the footwork, the foundation uh, for where we're going to go. Okay? I hope you'll join me. All right. Let's pray together. Holy God, we're here. We're here with you, trying to find you. So God... Help us to see you calling us in. Help us to look in the places that you can be found, to open our eyes, not just to see the sheep that we're taking care of, but to see your presence. God, I don't understand the holiness fully of you, but I know that you are different, you are uncommon. And God, make that a part of my life. That when people come into my presence, that the dirt around me the ground around me becomes a place where you reside, that they can experience you and know you. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together. Thank you for these beautiful little children. Continue to move in their lives. It's in your name. Amen. Will you stand with me as we close with this song? to be loved by Jesus Oh to be loved by Him Oh to have joy and peace within Oh to be loved by
Excuse, I hope you all have a wonderful Sunday. <laughs>